Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. To our guest of honor, Justice Zakaria Mohammed Yakub. Ladies and gentlemen, and for the first time in the history of Commonwealth Lawyers Association webinars, we have someone joining in from Greenland, and we would like to give them a special welcome. Every year, on 10th December, the world celebrates Human Rights Day. The theme this year is equality, reducing inequalities, advancing human rights. In celebration of this important day on the world calendar, the Commonwealth Lawyers Association Africa Hub is delighted to host this public lecture. And who better to speak on human rights than our guest this afternoon, retired judge of the South African Constitutional Court, Justice Zaki Aku. He prefers that I call him Zach, but I'm an African child and my ancestors will not let me be on first name basis with my elders. Edward Snowden said, every person remembers some moment in their life where they witnessed some injustice, big or small, and looked away because the consequences of intervening seemed too intimidating. But there's a limit to the amount of incivility, inequality, and inhumanity that each individual can tolerate. I crossed that line and I'm no longer alone. End of quote. Part of Judge Yakub's story that stands out for me is the fact that he crossed that line years ago. And it is my hope that by the end of his presentation this afternoon, you too would decide to cross that line. Judge Yakub was a member of the ANC underground. He defended political prisoners charged under unjust apartheid laws and took up cases to help victims of detention, house arrest, and other restrictive orders. And as evidence that fighting for human rights is a passion for him, since retirement, he has sat on a tribunal looking into the Cuban Five in March 2014, as well as chaired the Tribunal on the Indonesian Atrocities of the 1960s at The Hague. Justice Yakub will be speaking to us on the topic of limitations of lawyering and court cases in the elimination of inequalities. My name is Edwina Mazunda. I am the communications officer and newsletter editor of the Africa Hub of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And I will be hosting today's public lecture. I will now call upon the Commonwealth Lawyers Association Vice President for Africa, Ms. Linda Kasonde, to formally introduce and invite our guest speaker. Ms. Linda. Thank you, Edwina. Welcome to the third public lecture of the Africa Hub of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. I recognize the presence of our president, Mr. Brian Spears, past president, Mr. Santan Krishnan, all judges and lawyers present. The Commonwealth Lawyers Association's mission is to advance the cause of human rights and the rule of law across the Commonwealth. Following recent amendments to the CLA's constitution, the Africa Hub will grow to include representatives from each country in the African Commonwealth. Aside from the public lecture series and offering solidarity to lawyers and judges under attack, the Hub hosts various webinars on various topics and has created a Women's Lawyers Leadership Initiative in which we've collaborated with the Institute of African Women Lawyers to promote leading women lawyers. We look forward to you joining the hub to broaden the diversity of our representation and our offering to our members. Today, I'm especially thrilled to present to you today's speaker, Justice Zach Yacoub, or Zach as he prefers to be known. Zach retired as a judge of the Constitutional Court after 15 years of service on the 31st of January, 2013. He completed a BA and LLB at the University of Durban Westville at the end of 1972 and practiced at the then Natal Bar as junior and senior counsel until 31st January 1998. Whilst in practice as an advocate, 
In addition to commercial work, he was engaged in community activities, was a member of the underground ANC, defended political prisoners, and helped victims of detention, house arrest, and other restrictive orders. He was also a member of the negotiation process, and in particular, of the committee responsible for the finalization of the Bill of Rights of the Interim Constitution of South Africa. He, he is also the Independent Electoral Commission, responsible for South Africa's first democratic election in 1994, and also on the Independent Panel of Experts that advised the Constitutional Assembly in relation to the, the draft of the final constitution. He's recognized in national and international legal circles for his contribution to the social economic rights jurisprudence of South Africa. Since his retirement, Zach was awarded the Kentridge Award for Services to the Law in Southern Africa and continues to engage in judicial training, lecturing at universities, and sits on the boards of various NGOs. As you can see, Today's speaker is eminently qualified to speak to the topic uh, of today's lecture, the limitations of court actions and lawyering in tackling inequality. Judge Zak will draw on his experiences as an anti-apartheid activist to create his argument. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justice Zak Yakub. Thank you very, very much colleagues. Uh, may I start by making a little housekeeping thing, which is that I can hear somebody's keyboard loudly here. It is not me. So that is what is disturbing the proceedings. I can't do anything more. Everything is quiet here. And I hope it is okay. And there is a keyboard, so which I can hear, which continuously disturb proceedings. Uh, can I ask, uh, uh, is there still noise now or am I okay? Because I can't, I can't, I can't. Oh, good. Okay. I heard that. Thank you. It's fine. So, colleagues, good afternoon to everybody. And I make no apologies for the fact that although there are a lot of so called very important people here, I'm not going to mention any of them by name or by designation without any apology at all because I do this in the interest of an overall long-term definition of equality. We are all equal and it will be wrong for me to single out anybody who is more important than others. We are all colleagues. And let me start by saying, good afternoon colleagues. Colleagues in the struggle for democracy, colleagues in the struggle for, for equality, colleagues who are lawyers of all kinds, judges, magistrates, uh, and many, and academic lawyers as well, and all activists who are not necessarily lawyers, who do a great deal to make things happen for us. So I just want to say good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. To all of you, as my colleagues, in the achievement of democracy, not only in Africa, but in the world. I thought I should start by saying a few things uh, about myself, because I think it is, it's fairly important for you to understand, because one of the first points I want to make is that we are really not born with the equality drilled into our senses. So when I was a little boy, as a blind kid at the School for the Blind, in the realm of apartheid here, I used to be ashamed to admit, but I'm now no longer ashamed to admit, that I thought, honestly, as a young boy, that all African people were low-class citizens, I thought that the whites in this country were the best of the best. I'm a person of Indian origin and the people who were born colored so-called in our country of mixed relationships were called colored people. And I thought that we Indian people 
if we try very hard, could one day be as good as the white people. I was sexist and so on. And my development began in my first year at university in 1967. I soon began to realize as a result of the fact that somehow I joined these left-wing circles who studied Karl Marx and Marcuse and interesting sociology and so on and so on. And I started on the basis of the understanding that our whole society was an absolute mess such a mess that society would have to be destroyed completely and absolutely and rebuilt. Otherwise, otherwise we would not get there. I think many of you are aware of the names of those theoreticians who attracted me in those days. But thank goodness I did not remain that way. And I began to realize that we could all change and begin to be different. I realized quite quickly that I could not want other people as a blind person to treat me equally and accommodate me if I were difficult in relation to other people. And the racial segregation part was very easy for me. It was comparatively very easy, although it's easy, easier to talk about non-racialism than to truly live it. But the racial part was easy, it took a couple of years at, at university, but I had an, an incident where we first went to a university at which the white lecturers from the apartheid system who were to lecture to us were sent from other mainline universities to the special university for so-called Indians at which any lecturer would do. And I went to a lecture delivered by a white man and I to put it very simply, his lecture was absolutely idiotic. And I suddenly came to the conclusion that there are actually stupid white people in the world. And that was a huge realization for me. And then I had contact with African people who were at medical school, who were learning to be doctors. And by talking to them, I, who thought I was very clever, immediately realized that those people were much cleverer and much more intelligent than I was. And once I realized that, it was the beginning of the beginning. Some people might say it was the beginning of the end, but it was indeed the beginning of the beginning. And law began to take a new character. I joined the underground of the African National Congress quite early and life changed completely and absolutely. Life was different and the road to becoming a Democrat began. I'll finish this part of the story as quickly as I can. But for me, racism was easy. To overcome sexism was the most difficult part of them all because I did regard women as sort of there to serve us who should be cared for, who should be looked after, whose doors should be opened when they got into motor cars and so on. I still do that, but for a slightly different reason, I think. And, and, and the, the, I only became a true non-sexist actually when I was 30 years old much later in my life than I should, should have. And it is actually quite a serious struggle in some ways. So the first point I wanted to make is that we must not be embarrassed with not feeling totally non-racial and totally non-sexist at this stage of our lives. And of course, one of the struggles also, which, which was not very difficult for me, I must say, was to accept gay and lesbian people as absolutely and totally equal in my lives. And one of the problems I had 
was that blind people refused to be discriminated against by others, but they would refuse to be driven by deaf drivers, for example, which I found quite, quite pathetic in some ways. African men would discriminate against African women, which was quite a serious problem for me. We would find that all people in heterosexual society, blind, deaf, African, whatever their own problems were, would discriminate against gay and lesbian people. And that is what led me to the realization that the struggle for democracy is one integrated, huge struggle. It cannot by any means be divided into compartments. They work together and the liberation of one aspect of society results in the liberation of another. And it's a process in which it is important for all of us to take a part. Now let's get to lawyering. Lawyering is extremely important in society. I was a lawyer, and I suppose that the true reason why I really began to become a democratic lawyer as a lawyer is that ordinarily lawyers wouldn't send me any work because in simple terms, they thought that because I was blind, I couldn't think either. I was at first angered by that, but later amused considerably by it. So it was an uphill battle. It was, it was a difficult battle, but what that meant was that I didn't have enough commercial work through which I could make money. And therefore I did lots of work for poor people, first out of necessity, not out of a sense of duty, because I had nothing else to do. So I did lots of work for poor people for free. I did lots of work for poor people on the basis I'll get paid later. I did lots of work for democracy and so on. But I must emphasize that that was not a passion to start with. It was a necessity. And as a result of that, I associated with a whole range of different people. Now, we lawyers, and I did it too, tend to overestimate the importance of the law and the importance of court cases in achieving democracy in the world, in achieving democracy in our country. Let me give you a few examples of why that is not an appropriate approach. The first example I would give is that the constitutional court of our country held that gay and lesbian people in our country should not be criminals and should be able to get married years and years ago. And yet 90% of the people in South Africa, and I would say 90% of the people in the world and I have not conducted any survey because many people would lie about it because of their religious convictions, believe that gay and lesbian people live in sin. The constitution provides and all the prudence would say that men and women are equal. And yet we do not live our lives in that way. We live our lives as if men are superior 90% of men do that. It is true that once in a while, women oppress men too. But there are some men who over-exaggerate that and imply that they too are the victims of oppression. But we must not forget that if we look carefully at our experiences, the people who um, who actually oppress men, women who oppress men are very few and far between. I'm getting a little serious. Let me, let me tell you a light story, which I hope you will enjoy. I met a wonderful French man about two months ago and over drinks one evening, we began talking. And he said to me, you know, when I got married, 
I came to the firm conclusion that I had to be the boss. And I defined what is meant by being the boss. And I came to the firm conclusion that as long as I have the final decision in all important matters, it is fine. It is a credit to his wife for him then to say the following. It took me one week into my marriage to realize that there is no such thing as an important decision. And therefore, I am still the boss. Now, I hope that some of you enjoy that story half as much as I did, because I thought that, that, that it tells absolute volumes. But the point I was making to get back to the more serious bit is that lawyery and court cases by themselves cannot cut it, to put it simply, because then lawyers and court will live in their own elitist society with a few elitist friends who espouse wonderful notions of togetherness and openness and equality and so on and so on, while quietly you continue to oppress all other people. So make no mistake, I am not undervaluing lawyering at all. I think that lawyering is extremely important. But if lawyering is to contribute towards the achievement of democracy, then that lawyering, democratic lawyering, has to be an integral part of the democratic struggle as a whole. You can't have different aspects of the democratic struggle which come together at the level of some kind of alliance, which is what we have many, many times now. It's a difficult problem, but it's a problem where lawyering must be an integral part of the struggle. My own experience about that is that I was an activist while I was a lawyer. So, as a lawyer in the community, I helped with the drafting of pamphlets. I helped with the drafting of literature. I helped making house visits, talking to people on a day-to-day -day basis about achieving our democracy. And we adopted uh, an approach which resulted in ensuring that we used day-to-day -day issues and many people take the word used and say we were utilitarian and used other people, but I nevertheless use the word advisedly. All of us got together and used day-to-day -day issues as a way of enhancing the struggle for democracy. So let me give you an example. People on the ground have problems relating to unaffordable water and high rental and uh, high rental in homes, which they could not afford. Now, there was a struggle on the ground to reduce rental, and we had to bring some kind of court action, which arose from that struggle on the ground. And then we had a godsend, because the godsend was that we had water restrictions in our country, and the government had a policy where there was, there, were, there was one water measuring instrument for every six houses in a block in a township in Phoenix. And the law was that if you use more than the water that is allowed to you as a family, then you pay a huge fine. But now because these six families had only one water measuring unit, what they did was when there was an overcharge, they split the fine amongst all the people who are occupying that block of six, the huge fine, without knowing who was guilty and who was not guilty. And we went to court, but we went to court in that matter, not as lawyers. It was a community action. The community was briefed. We were instructed by meetings of the people to bring the action. 
Every settlement proposal was taken back to the community. There were negotiations every step of the way. And we had planned for what we would do if we win the case. And we had planned for what we would do if we would lose the case. If we lost the case, of course, we would be very angry. And the fact that we lost the case at the instance of the court will be, uh, will be fought at another level, which was organized for in advance. If we won the case, it wasn't the end, because that victory took us to another level. And that level enabled us to strive towards something else. We won the water case. And when, when we won the water case, we were all so happy. Ordinary people were so happy because rightly, the belief was that it was the struggle for democracy that gave rise to the victory. It was not the work of lawyers. And that is the basis on which struggles were taken from level to level. So we must not lose contact with people. We've got to make sure that we keep in touch with the people, that the people as a whole remain in charge of the struggle for democracy. And of course, the people as a whole are limited because the process of organizing and mobilizing is not simple and straightforward. And very often, we have a large meeting at which 5,000 people are present. In, but there is a community of a million people in, in there. And we sort of begin to think that the 5,000 people represent the million. And we talk to the people at that level. But as long as we understand that that 5,000 has to grow to 6,000, that 6,000 has to grow to 7,000, so that the process of becoming truly democratic and truly representative is a slow and difficult process. So that is a one aspect in which we can say that we are not relying on lawyering alone, that lawyering is the servant of the struggle. All lawyers say, and it has become now the fashion to do so, that they take instructions from their client. Of course, that is often used as a way of doing what we want to do and hiding our true feelings. But there's nothing that can be truer than that when we talk about the struggle for democracy. Because in the struggle for democracy, the democratic lawyer is the servant of the struggle. And in the same way, as a lawyer takes instructions from his client, the democratic lawyer takes instructions from the democratic struggle. The difference, of course, is that he, he, if that lawyer is truly democratic, he or she will be part of that struggle. He or she will be attending those meetings. He or she will participate in that meeting. And he or she will have the humility to be bound by the majority decisions at that meeting and to move forward. It has happened many times that the majority went against the everyone called participants. Please have your questions I click. At the time of, 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 of consolidation, and the problem was that we could not, we could not carry on as if the struggle did not exist at all. The next thing that needs careful definition is what is the democratic lawyer? Who is a democratic lawyer? I want to start with a simple statement that a democratic lawyer is a good human being first, is a participant in the struggle for democracy second, and a democratic lawyer only third. In my view, the first two requirements are prerequisites for the development of the truly democratic lawyer. But there is no need to despair because my definitions are definitions of the ideal. Absolutely true democratic lawyers 
never exist. I am not one either. And we learn and we change as we go on and on. The concept of, of democracy changes, the concept of lawyering changes. And the point is that we talk about ideals to move ourselves forward as lawyers, to move ourselves forward as human beings. But as a matter of reality, and not as a matter of ideals, it is very important for a democratic lawyer to be a democrat first. Because if a democratic lawyer has no respect, no genuine respect for poor and vulnerable human beings, it's a problem. If the democratic lawyer has, does not practice equality, does not practice non-sexism, does not practice an integrate, integrative approach in their own lives, we have got very, very serious problems. So that the first step is for us to continue, and this too is an ideal which is never achieved immediately. It takes time but we must continue to concentrate on developing ourselves into better and better Democrats. And the way to do this is to ensure that we participate in, our democ in the democratic process, that we learn. And one always talks about a social revolution. And the social revolution actually starts small. It doesn't grow big. We are lawyers first, or we are human beings first, we know other human beings. We talk about them, we talk to them about our beliefs in our own home, in their homes, when we visit them, when we chat to them, when we meet with them over a drink, you know, one meets all sorts of undemocratic sexist people at weddings and social occasions and so on and so on. And one mustn't make too much of it, but it is very important. On the one hand, to remain friendly and nice to people, not to uh, lord it over them, but on the other hand, very gently and carefully to make the point. So in the end, it all starts with our own change and it all starts with making that change grow. And my own conception of change is that human awareness becomes wider, broader, and broader and things change. Let me give you one example. In the 19th century, people in America and England, the so-called so civilized people in this world, and I'm quite sure that African people didn't think that in the 18th and 19th centuries, though I have not quite researched it, genuinely believed that people who killed deer and cut down certain valuable trees ought to be sentenced to death. So around in about 200 years, humanity has undergone a phenomenal change. And I think uh, that I can make one generalization, which is acceptable, that 200 years has resulted in the fact that nobody would begin to think that now. And that is because society has developed slowly and carefully. And now the number of countries that inflict the death penalty are few and far between. The majority of people when the chips are down still shout out about the death penalty, but that majority is, is reducing. And hopefully, and change takes place slowly. If we do our work properly, in another 200 years, as a result of very hard work on the outside, every human being will be thinking this death penalty thing. I don't know how these uncivilized people 100 years, 100 years ago began to think that it could be a penalty at all. If we do our work properly, Humanity will instinctively come to that conclusion. And lawyers have changed too. 
I went to New York in 1985. I met many lawyers then, and I hope one or two of them are listening somewhere. And I found very few. I met out of the 40 lawyers or so I met in 1985, I met only two lawyers who were against the death penalty. The others spoke up against it. And I went to New York more recently and I met lots of lawyers then. And the balance has shifted considerably because things have changed. That Democrats have done their work. Democratic lawyers have done their work. But do not make the mistake of thinking that what I'm saying is that whatever we do, change is inevitable and change will happen anyway. Nothing could be further from the truth. If we carry on in our old ways and let things slide, we will not reach the state of humanity, which I would like us to reach in 200 years. I doubt ever we will ever reach it, even in a thousand years. And the achievement of, of, of non-racialism is a difficult business because racism is a worldwide phenomenon. It's easy to talk about the whites in the United States of America and the whites in Britain and so on. But we must think quite often of the racism of people in our own ranks. There are many people I know in our rank who are racist still, who will not admit it easily, but it comes out in some ways. There are many people in this, in this world who are sexist still. There was a guy who will remain nameless who applied for a job and I was conducting interviews as, uh, and he was being interviewed by three women and one man as the director of litigation in one of these non-sexist uh, democratic organizations of which I am a member of the board. And you will not believe that today that man addressed his letter asking for this appointment as dear sirs. And it was quite amazing that, that someone did that. One must remember, because I say we must begin with ourselves and I can say without contradiction, as a person of Indian origin, I'd rather go and look at the people from whom I originated. People in the North of India still look down on the darker people in Northern India uh, because of their culture their music and so on and so on. I know, for example, that there are two categories of, 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 of so-called colored people in our country. And I have friends in both categories. A person who is a judge in our country now told me the story and he has, he's one of these dark characters with wavy hair. And he told me, that when he fell in love, he made the mistake of falling in love. By the way, it transpired not to be a mistake. They're very happy together now. But they made the mistake of falling in love with a, a, a colored woman who had fair skin and who had straight hair. And the parents of the girl, would, woman, would have nothing to do with him at the time. And this is what, in South Africa, 30 years ago? And that is not a long time ago in South Africa. So everyone, we have a long, difficult, exciting struggle forward. It means for all of us, changing ourselves. It means for society, changing society. We are as guilty as everyone else. We may be somewhat better, but let us accept the chance of change and let us ensure that lawyering is not the only way. So the first step we must learn is that law is not only about making money. We do, unfortunately, and I do too. I lead a better life than many, many poor people in our society. I try and 
reduced my expenditure and my cost of living, but I have a wonderful computer and good internet and a delightful office and I'm very comfortable. I am better off than millions of poor people. I do what I can. I still feel a little guilty that, that we don't do enough because somehow we look after our own, our own children, we want them to have a good future and so on and so on. But these are difficult choices which we will make to the best of our ability. So let us embrace human rights today. Let us embrace human rights on the ground. Let us not overestimate ourselves in the process of that democracy. Let us all get involved so that in a meeting of this kind in 200 years, the democratic lawyers, if they meet on human rights today, will be talking a very, very different language. Let us have the courage, let us go ahead, let us move forward, and I wish you all the luck in your deliberations. Thank you very much indeed, and I'm available to answer any questions uh, that I need to. And if anyone disagrees with me on it, anything, just feel free to say so, and we will discuss it openly and properly. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Judge Yakub, for an insightful lecture and a call to embrace human rights um, in and of ourselves as lawyers and not to separate ourselves from the communities that we live in. I will be taking questions from the participants. You can post your questions in the chat function and I'll be able to read them out to the judge. I don't see any questions currently, um, but to start us off, judge, I was wondering, your story into being an activist sounded to me like you started because you were not getting commercial work. But for somebody who says they're okay with the work they're getting as a lawyer, what would be your advice into moving into activism or embracing it as well? Okay, my advice is that to be lawyers make much more money than they need. I am much better off compared to many other people, but I am not as well off as many, many of my colleagues who've led their lives differently. So if you are getting, if, if, if you are okay and you're doing well, you've got to decide for yourself, and it's a very difficult decision, what is the moral limit? Because look at this. Lawyers who work at universities and lecturers earn much less money than practicing lawyers. And they do so because they have an interest in academics. They earn less money, not because they are less competent lawyers, but they make a different contribution to our democracy. And I would suggest, speaking for myself, uh, that looking at the income of a lecturer at a law lecturer at a university, a high income level, and pegging your kind of income at that level and saying, okay, if my colleagues as lawyers live like this at university, I'll live this way too, and then spend the rest of your time doing things. So there will always be, if you, if you are not into just making money and nothing else, and if into buying yourself a house and ensuring that your children have reasonable education and reasonable food, there'll still be plenty of time to do other work to change society and make it better and to be part of it. But of course, uh, there are two problems. The one is that some people just want to continue making money. The other problem is that some people find it difficult to make even the basic minimum because of the kind of lawyers we are. 
And that person is really battling to make an existence. My uh, feeling about that is that you do work to help more and more people. And you will find, as I did, if you're just okay and you want to be a little better and you're battling to be okay, I found that I was much better off and made more money, which was the byproduct of doing free work for the community. But making up money must not be fundamentally all. You have to live by other things. Thank you, Judge. Just as a follow-up to that, what, what would you say drew the courage out of you every single time for you to keep up being an activist even to the point where your own life has threatened in some instances, what is that one thing that kept you going in those moments? No, for me, it was a natural thing. It was something that I just did. I honestly didn't feel that I was doing something great. I didn't think that I had to do it. Uh, and, 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 and fortunately, I, I didn't have to, I don't know, you know, I, I, I often think what I would do if I were tortured. And I honestly think that if I were, I would tell them everything immediately. I don't have, I don't think, I was never tortured, for which I'm very grateful. I really don't think I have that kind of courage because I was lucky, because I couldn't see, people didn't think that I was doing all these things. So I got away with a head of a lot. I was not detained. My life was in danger a couple of times, but that was dealt with in some ways. Uh, but I wasn't detained for long periods. I wasn't tortured and so on. And in that, I was very, very lucky. So I have to say that, that for people who are detained, for people who are tortured and so on, I have the greatest of sympathy and the greatest of respect. And actually, it, 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 if I have to say it, now that I'm thinking about it in more detail, it is the knowledge of those people who I knew who were detained and tortured. Now, it is the knowledge of other people, whether I know them or not, who are detained and tortured and who suffer a great deal, which keeps me going. We have a question from patients, um, and I think you've just touched on it just now, but I'll read it out still. It says, no doubt being a human rights and a democratic activist is a dangerous one. One could be persecuted or his or her life could be threatened. Have you ever been threatened by anyone because of your work and how did you deal with it? I was threatened a couple of times and I dealt with it by publicizing it within certain circles and making sure that I didn't keep it quiet. There was a time when uh, a whole range of people came home to burn down our house. And that was quite a difficult time, but it was amazing how, how many neighbors who are not activists or anything of the kind, but who knew me and who knew, knew me well, came as soon as they, the first two or three people came, there were 50 or 60 people who came to the house and were outside ready to defend us. And that was the thing. So I suppose my life was never seriously threatened at that level. There were, there were threats, um, small ones, but I never had uh, the kind of threat where uh, I, was, I was in some place about to be killed and being killed was like on the agenda about to happen in the next 10 or 15 minutes. 
the threats were always distant and they could be managed as distant threats. Thank you. Another question from Nadia it says, firstly, truly blessed to attend this webinar and listening to Justice Yakub. It is always said that it is up to the youth to change the status of the country and help improve on the issues and difficulties of the people in their country. How do you think millennials will fare as young Democrats with the goal of changing society and creating an environment of true equality in all aspects? I think that how well people fare depends on how much they do. And if they work sensibly and if they work carefully, it's impossible to advise unless you know the circumstances. If you work genuinely, if you work carefully and not become adventurous about it, and if you take your time, do what you need to do and make sure that people are behind you, it may take longer, but you will definitely succeed. It is better to know that we may not succeed in our lifetime. In our lifetime, we'll get from point A to point B. I mean, I still think it would have been better if I had achieved more than uh, uh, I finished for 99% of my working life now, I think. And I would rather have hoped that the world were, now that I'm about to come to an end, that the world were a lot more sex, uh, non-sexist, a lot more non-racist, a lot more equal than it is. But I've accepted that it will take a long time. A very short lawyer who works for the government become an activist. Well, I, I think that uh, you don't have to be an activist in the open and true sense of the word. You don't have to put out your chest and say, I am an activist. I have known many, many people who worked in government, who worked in government departments, and who kept to themselves, did what they had to do in connection with their work, and were activists in their own right. We had people in the apartheid government, for example, who would organize false passports for us. Not because um, we paid them money, it wasn't a bribery element at all, because they were committed to the struggle and they, as underground activists in government, did their work as government properly and at the same time ensured that they helped the struggle to the extent to which they could. And if they had within the struggle, people who manage them carefully, then the best would be brought out of them in many, many ways. So there are many people in governments in many parts of the world who still participate in the democratic struggle without saying sometimes you have to participate in the struggle for democracy without saying to the whole world that you are doing so. And there are many people who do so at that level. Thank you. Another question says, racism, is, racism has an economic foundation. How successful is the law being in addressing the economic roots of racism? OK, the law has not been successful at all. In, 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 in addressing the economics of racism. And South Africa, perhaps, I have to concede, has been one of the greatest failures in that regard. And one of the things I have to say is that I was an underground member of the African National Congress. Many of you have heard of Jacob Zuma, the president of our country, who did so many, so many horrible things. I have to say that he was a very good commander of mine in the underground. He commanded me very, very well in those days. 
I must say that I expected the African National Congress to be the best and absolute government in the world. There were many of us who were disappointed because here we are, we have had a very, very corrupt African National Congress. And therefore, the answer is the notion that we have always believed in. Would we stop practicing when African National Congress, which was civil society, became government? We always espouse the principle that governments, of course, we made an exception in relation to the African National Congress in those days, wrongly, I now concede, although the ANC would still say that we were right now. But leaving aside that exception, part of the mantra of our struggle was that however the democratic the government we may have, government will never remain honest, democratic, and non-corrupt without a strong civil society. And if I were to put it objectively, what happened in our country is that the people who constituted civil society went to government and civil society had become weak and government had ceased to become accountable. So I must say that putting pressure on government and developing a very strong civil society which would bring government to account at every turn is a fundamental element of that democracy. So it is not only about having a democratic government, it is about ensuring that one continues to have a very strong democratic society because a government, because that is why our constitution says that government must be accountable to the people. Having an unaccountable government is the recipe for corruption and absolute disaster. And governments don't become accountable only because they are wonderful governments. Governments become accountable only if in reality, people in strong civil society take steps to ensure that government remains accountable. And however democratic your government is, however wonderful your government is, they will still take you to task for holding government accountable. I have held governments accountable for the last five or six years in the words that I have spoken. And I promise you that you will find very, very few people in government today who would speak well of me in this country. Judge, another question says, South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world, yet it is home to some of the most advanced jurisprudence on socioeconomic rights. Do you think lawyers in South Africa are doing enough outside of the courtroom? I don't think so. I think that lawyers should be able to do more enough, uh, more than they are doing at the moment. And I think more importantly, we need more lawyers to join the struggle for democracy. And my own feeling at the moment is, and I haven't looked at it recently, and I think that's so in most countries. If 5% of lawyers in any country are really working members of democratic lawyers organizations, then that's a very high number. And we must be honest about this. It's a very, very high number. And therefore the problem is, that in this country, at the very least, 90% of our lawyers are interested only in themselves, in their own practices, and do nothing towards democracy. I think it will be higher than 90%. And you will find many lawyers in South Africa speaking out against me now after what I've said today. 
but it does happen to be true. And I would like any lawyer in any country to say that actually more than 10% of the lawyers in my country are truly democratic. If one of you can say that now and mean it, I will eat humble pie. So the problem is that the democratic human being is the exception to the norm and the, demo, the truly democratic lawyer is the exception to the norm. And if we can reach the stage where five, 10, 15% of our lawyers are truly democratic, we would have done wonderfully well. Thanks, Judge. Almost as a follow-up to your response just now, Joseph says, is having an attacker and a defender in front of a judge and or a jury the best way to unfold the truth? It's not necessarily the best way, but it is a good way. It is a good way provided that we understand some basic things. The lawyer's job on behalf of the state is not to win the case for the state. The lawyer's job on behalf of the accused or the other side is not to win the case for the other side. Democracy requires every person to be able to have a say and every person has the right to be heard. And the duty of a lawyer is no more, no less than to present the case of his clients in the democratic spirit and to the best of his ability without um, following every instruction of client, however immoral or however improper it may be. Unfortunately, I'm afraid that when you have rich clients who have lawyers who are intent on making money, then the rich clients dictate the rules. If you have prosecutors who are earning a lot of money and they're very senior and they want to keep their jobs, then quite often government dictates the roost. So in some ways, democratic lawyers, both on both sides, have got to develop the art of democratic lawyering for the system to work properly. Well, speaking of human rights, Kennedy says, is it right for criminals to be punished through death by hanging, as this is an issue of human rights. I have made it quite clear already, I think, that the death penalty is absolutely and utterly out. You know, you know what the death penalty actually amounts to? It's like saying that a guy who commits theft must have things stolen from his house for him to understand and not to commit theft again. It's like saying that a guy who commits rape must also be raped. It's like saying that a guy who commits fraud must also be defrauded. I use the word guy because I think men do more of these things than women today that I know of. But I think that is part of the problem. That is part of the problem is that you cannot an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth is completely wrong. Of course, if we're talking criminal law, there are these days wonderful concepts of restorative justice, which are beginning to work. They've begun to start in South Africa to a degree, so that what you try to do in the case of crime is to produce some kind of reconciliation between victim and um, and, uh, and committer. And on that basis, you try and achieve a true reconciliation, not a naming reconciliation. Because if you say to who somebody who's committed a crime that if he reconciles properly, he won't go to jail, of course the human condition will make him say that he reconciles completely and he or she will act so wonderfully well during the six month period of counseling that you might believe that person. But in reality, we've got to slowly in the end. I mean, death penalty is wrong. 
I think sending three people to prison doesn't generally speaking help help either. We've got to, if we enter into true, true transformation, and I'm talking about years and years ahead now, develop the concept of restorative justice, a way of restoring society rather than using the damage that people commit to society when they do bad things to damage them as well. So that too amounts to an eye for an eye, a truth for a truth of it. A question from Naomi says, thank you for the lecture, Justice Yakub. My question is, is equality in social, economic and cultural rights achievable or should there be a paradigm shift to equity? I think that it is achievable. I think that there is an important reason why rural areas should be developed. And I didn't, I didn't complete my answer. I, I, I think that if our government had not been corrupt and if social and economic rights had been properly understood by our government, things would have gone a long, long way. So that if, if one accepts the incremental nature of social and economic rights um, and works at it carefully to ensure that realistically the implementation of the rights becomes better and better, we will do well. But if you want to produce in society like the kind of radical I was when I was 19, and if we carry on as we are, then inevitably uh, the kind of revolution where people begin to believe that they should just destroy everything to make things better will become the order of the day. And you don't avoid that by putting people like that in jail, you see. You avoid that in the long term by creating a new social order and by taking people seriously in that way. So in a certain sort of inevit inevitability, Either we do it carefully and slowly, and we've just managed to avoid it. We've done it carefully, but not well enough. Or the people will have every right to take over as an inevitability with the necessary destruction of assets and so on and so on, which the people will not be responsible for who do it, which we, the supposedly more powerful, will be, must take more responsibility for. Um, another question from Mike says, Judge, thank you for your time and lecture. I am of the view that you being an activist, a lawyer, and subsequently a judge, you may have had a high level of interaction with the international community at large. How did you relate with and or how did you appreciate with the level at which the international community enhanced the development of human rights enforcement internationally? Yeah, I, I, I had a lot of contact. I thought that they were, they were very important movements, but um, I, I, I only had problems to the extent where they were substitutes for struggles on the ground. So my only qualification would be that every activist in the international sector should have a firm root and grounding, not only in the international sphere, but in the country from which they come. And the final question, Judge, says, how should a lawyer deal with the media? Are there good ways to leverage the fourth estate? I don't know. It, it, it just depends on what the problem is uh, at the time. Sometimes they have to be dealt, dealt with harshly. Sometimes they've got to, deal, to, to be dealt with carefully. But that's a question. There's no... 
I think people understand that there's no general answer to a question like that. There is no recipe. If one has a particular problem, then the context and the timing and exactly what happens and who the reporter is and what the reporter's history is and what the history of the particular media house is and what the objective is of dealing with them would, 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 would determine what your action should be. So that's a matter of a tactic, an appropriate tactic or an appropriate strategy at a broader level to be adopted, taking into account all the relevant circumstances at the particular time. It's not capable of a general answer. Do you have an example, Judge, of when you had to deal strategically or tactfully with the media? Well, I have, I have examples on both sides. I've dealt badly with the media and I've dealt uh, well with the media. I've dealt well with the media most times. We had lots of media under our control in, um, at the time of our democracy. Some people would be against us and some people would be for us and we use the people for us strongly and carefully and we criticize the people against us. More recently, I've not done so well, uh, I must say. I mean, it, it has been public news and I wonder whether the questioner has this in mind when uh, the question is asked, but it has been public news that um, I get very angry when, when media lie to me. So I'll just give you an example. There was, um, I was the, uh, uh, the, the, the chair of the interim board of Cricket South Africa, in which, uh, and this is a very good example of the fact that uh, once you get your hands dirty, you get everywhere and you get into that kind of trouble. And um, I'm happy to say that none of my colleagues think I acted badly in the matter, but I'll tell you about it because you're not always right in what you do. So here was this, this journalist who lied about me saying that there were corruption, there were proceedings in a, in a legal entity called the CCMA relating to my fraudulent conduct, which were currently under adjournment. And that was absolutely published. Of course, the civilized way was to have shaken one's head, was to have written to the editorial board, that would have been a wonderful way to do it. But of course, the lawyer called me to get more particulars and I got very angry because that's the reality of life. And I swore at him, as a result of which I got a very bad reputation and as a result of which I had to re uh, resign as the chair of the interim cricket board. So these things happen too. You can't always be perfect in what you do. And I hope now that you're not regretting that you invited me to speak here. Judge, I think I speak for the CLA when I say we have been delighted to have you and we're not regretting at all. But just in case, and just to confirm, let me call upon Ms. Linda, the Vice President for Africa to give us her closing remarks. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank you, it was wonderful to be here. Uh, thank you, Judge, uh, Zach, uh, for that wonderful presentation. I think it was food for thought for all of us. Um, you know, Leo Toy Story, one, Toy Story once said, uh, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. And I think uh, through your presentation, you've given us a good illustration how it is possible to evolve, um, not only to become um, more racially sensitive, but also sensitive in terms of uh, gender sensitivity um, and become truly egalitarian in nature, or at least aspire to be. Um, it was wonderful how you illustrated how uh, exposure to different people actually broke down barriers in terms of all those things that I mentioned, whether it was race, whether it was sex, whether it was sexual orientation. And I think that's something that, that can be learned by all of us, that the more you expose yourself to other people, the greater you, you'll see the similarity in all of us. And that in fact, we are all the same and we all aspire for our lives to have dignity and meaning. 
Um, as you say, the, liber the liberation of one part of society liberates others and us as lawyers can do our part in ensuring that um, we represent causes that uh, liberate others in as much as we can. And that to do so, we must all be democratic lawyers. Um, not only, uh, and to be so, we have to be good human beings, firstly, um, pursue democracy and also more importantly, exercise democracy in everything that we do. Although of course, as you mentioned, this is a high ideal which uh, we can only strive for as nobody's perfect. Um, but all in all, um, we must aspire to develop ourselves into better Democrats, better people, more egalitarian um, by truly um, introspecting and seeing how we can be better in order to change the world. So thank you very much for your presentation. It was truly wonderful. And uh, we look forward to having you again. So on behalf of the CLA, uh, thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure I speak on, it on behalf of everybody by saying that it was uh, truly uh, illuminating and uh, we, we thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. And if uh, people ask you for my e email address, I can give it to them. And I don't mind talking to people online. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.